I don't do it so much anymore. I'm too busy. But I used to go to high schools and unis and talk and lecture. And, um, and I always said to those young people that it's so important they tell their stories and that they don't underestimate how powerful their own stories are. Um, being a human is a, an insane privilege. And every single one of us thinks our story is fairly boring. When you're living it, it feels yeah. <laughs> mundane. But mm, to everyone yeah. else, this, those stories are so extraordinary. And those collective stories speak to what it is to be human. And then, and I, I think by telling the stories and by talking about our, what we do, you open up dialogue that, that then enables big wounds to be healed and the taboo to be discussed and the world to become a better place. Yeah. Hey everyone, and Happy New Year. This is your host, Yoshino, and you are listening to Artist Decoded. That quote you just listened to was from episode number 57 with Australian painter Ben Quilty. And this is the first Mindwave episode of the year. I want to start doing more of these episodes, so please be on the lookout for them. I want to first talk about why I started the podcast. Then I'm going to cut together little excerpts and quotes from various guests into this episode from over the past three years of running and developing the podcast. It's a really interesting process for me to have to analyze my past conversations, but I think there's a lot of value in doing this. And I want to distill these little tidbits of wisdom into something tangible for my listeners that hopefully will help you on your journey as a creative. There is an arc to everyone's story, whether we're conscious of it or not. Our minds are crafted with every micro interaction. The devil is in the detail. And for me, it's always good to take a moment to pause and reflect on past teachings. Most of the time, the answers to our questions are already directly in front of us. But because of the constant distractions around us, we tend to gloss over a lot of the details. Sometimes I like to look at life like an ever-changing puzzle. I like to call this particular theory, puzzle theory. Imagine your life as a partially constructed puzzle, which represents your past experiences. Each piece has significance to it in some capacity, and how we lay the pieces down will determine how our lives will be constructed. The more careful we are with examining each edge and each piece, the more fruitful our labors will be, and the more informed we will be with moving on to the next piece to solve the puzzle. So to go into a little bit of my story, on September 3rd, 2015, on my 29th birthday, I started my journey into the podcasting world. And during this time, I found myself in an artistic rut, and I found myself being slowly detached and disenchanted from my career as a professional photographer. Everything that I previously strived for was falling apart. Not only was I in a rut, but I found myself in a very deep and dark period in my life. I was going through a lot of hardships in my personal life. A few years prior, my father passed away, and my relationship of over six years was ending too, which took a toll on me both mentally and physically. I had an unsettling feeling about my life at that point. And I felt a need and a desire to hear the opinions of my fellow colleagues within the arts. Why do they want to continue a career path in the arts? Why would someone want to continue a career path that has a lot of economic uncertainties? And why did I have this aching need to continue down this journey? The first episode was a painter, Casey Ba. Casey actually first reached out to me because a mutual friend of ours and fellow artist, Hannah Vandermolen, told Casey about my work as a photographer. I was very surprised because Casey is a master painter and an artist that I truly respect. The only way I can describe this connection is by pure alchemy and serendipity. Here's what Casey had to say about fear in relation to his views on his artistic practice in episode one. I think the best thing that I could say would, would basically be to have no fear. Obviously, we need to be smart about what we do, but fear is the number one entity that smothers 
careers, creativity, and progression. Fear of maybe, maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's a person who feels like they want to be in, in the art world. They want to be an artist, but they're not sure if it's going to work. So they play the safe bet. They get a full time job. They create on the side. They, they lay out way too many safety nets. And in doing so, they're allowing for failure rather than pushing forward saying, no, this will work. I will make this work. No fear. And that's, that's in the business side. Obviously the creative point, it's like, you just, you just go for it. No fear whatsoever. This was an incredibly uplifting thing to hear from Casey because I encountered so much fear during this time period, as well as a lot of economic fear and uncertainty because I was going through such a crazy transitional point in my life. This quote about having no fear really struck a chord with me. I think it's easy to be bogged down by fear when we're transitioning and stepping into new territory. I then had a conversation with fellow fashion and commercial photographer, Daniel Sandwald, on episode number 30. I asked him specifically about his experiences shooting. Daniel, being a seasoned veteran of the photography world, shooting for the likes of Nike, Mercedes, and Vogue, to name a few, I really aspired to be like Daniel. Here's what he had to say. Have you ever hit certain points of your career where you really doubted yourself a lot? So much to the point where you didn't shoot. Okay. So I think we all, or I hope we all, I'm very sure like every creative I met had points, not just once, many times where you'd be like, okay, what, what am I doing? Is it good what I'm doing? Am I on the right path? I had so many moments in my life where I was like, okay, I think I want to stop. I don't see any purpose anymore. I don't understand what I'm doing. I feel really lost. Every time I had like a really strong attack of anxiety or doubt, something really beautiful was born. Daniel's thoughts on being lost and having a lot of doubts and anxiety made things very relatable for me. It challenged me to think differently and to accept that the struggle for creativity is more of a humanistic thing rather than purely an artistic endeavor. I especially like what he said about beauty being on the other end of that anxiety and hardship. Sometimes we have a feeling of what direction we need to go in, but sometimes it's hard to put your finger on what exactly has to be done to achieve what you're meant to achieve. Navigating through life can be very difficult. Prior to this episode, I talked to painter and artist John Wentz on episode number two. We were talking about artists and inspiration during the segment. Wentz brought up two artists, Gerhard Richter and Antonio Lopez Garcia, who are continual inspirations for him. He told me about his experience going to Richter's retrospective at SF MoMA and how it saved him from dropping out of art school. I found this to be very encouraging. We also talked about how you have to focus on the long game as a creative. Which artist do you, are you the most inspired by? Living, dead, um, just artists in general? It always changes, but there would probably be two, like my, my two go-tos for, for different reasons. And uh, one is Gerhard Richter, has always been my all-time favorite. And now that also, as I'm saying that, I realize too, because there were kind of life changing events for me, um, discovering those artists and, uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia, who's out of Spain. Mm. Um, they were probably my two go tos, but not for like what would be, cause that's a weird question, especially now too. Like, um, when people, cause I think somebody asked that on the Instagram thing, like, who's your favorite artist or inspiration? Like, yeah. to me, that's a really ambiguous term now because. I think social media has kind of changed what inspiration is uh, big time, you know? So for me, it's like when I think inspiration, it's not just like, you know, a painting style. Like I've started painting like this because it's, it's, it's generally like, like with Richter, it's something bigger, like Richter, you know, when I discovered Richter, 
I was in high school. It is when I got um, Sonic Youth's Daydream Nation record. And he was on the cover of his painting, right? And I was like, I thought it was a photo. I'm like, wow, that's a cool photo. And then after a while, I was reading it. I'm like, who's this, you know, Gerhard Reich? You know, I can... And yeah, then, yeah, at that time. Yeah, and then it's like, wow, it's a painting. And then I discover, and then, you know, that was tied to the music, it, too. So that, like, had this impact. And then I saw his um, retrospective at the SF MoMA, I think it was in 2001. And I was just getting ready. I was going to drop out of art school because I was not having a good time. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like two, maybe three floors of work and just spanning his life. So you saw all the different periods he went through. And I was just blown away. What is it like for you to see someone that you admire that much and to see the span of their work? It's so encouraging. And, and again, In what way? It, that this is a lifelong endeavor. I think it's so easy, especially now, for artists to be like, you want something now. And the internet, I think, has a lot to do with this. It's like, I want to be known now. And it's, I think, exacerbated, too, because you, in some ways, can be known now, right? You put it on Instagram. You can put anything on there. I see people putting classwork, you know, stuff that we never had the ability to do. Like, I wouldn't put my class drawing out on the Internet. Like, you just wouldn't do that. Yeah. You know? But we didn't have it. You know what I mean? It's like it was just for these finished things. So I'm not saying it's good and bad. I'm just saying you have that ability. So I think there's this idea, it seems like, of just like, got to get known now. Got to get known now. But art's such a long-term thing, you know, which exactly. is one of the reasons why I decided to go from music to art. One of the things is like, you can have this lifelong career and it can get better and it can have downtime and valleys. And it's, it's a life. It's a, that's the word I'm looking for. It's a lifestyle, you know, kind of. And so that's what seeing Richter's whole span. I was just like, Oh, this is a dedication and mm -hmm. seeing all the creativity too, that he put into it, that kind of solidified for me as like, okay, I want to pursue this, you know, as yeah. a life thing. About a year after I did this conversation with John Wentz, I traveled to Australia on a photography job. While I was in Australia, I had the opportunity to interview painter Adam Lee. We were talking about the careers of painters Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, and Frank Auerbach. We then started to discuss the importance of finding a balance, to take the time to incubate ideas, while also meeting and having self-imposed deadlines. Here's our conversation from episode number 63. Yeah, because then I feel like it's more personal if you can view a certain artwork and it has some sort of significant meaning, not depending on, you know, the description or depending on what, who painted it or who, yeah. you know, came up with this, um, this piece. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, even when I was at, um, the Getty in, in Los Angeles, they have this uh, exhibit called London Calling, mm -hmm. and it's uh, Lucian Freud, Francis Bacon, Auerbach, mm -hmm. um, and a couple other painters. But that would have been awesome. Yeah, and I really was connecting with some of those Auerbach pieces. Mm. I, I've never seen I've never seen the, those in the flesh before, and it was I mean, oh, I didn't see I haven't seen some of those Bacon and um, yeah. Freud pieces before either, but yeah. Yeah, they're really powerful. It's really powerful to see some of these things in the flesh. Uh, Albach is like, I got to see a, the retrospective they did of Frank Albach uh, in London while I was there too last time. And it was like such a, an awesome show. Like those works, they're so thick with paint. Yeah. Like inches off the surface of the Yeah, surface. it's pretty crazy. And you just don't get that from looking at reproductions. And so when you see them in the flesh, they're so surprising to look at. It was one of one of the the best shows I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just love that idea of this sort of um, accruing accruing of of time and material and yeah. You know, do you try to do that with your own works? I mean, spend a, a, a good amount of time to let it develop. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, most there are certain works that I'll make in one sitting, but they're quite rare. So the majority of them have been made quite slowly over a long period of time but but having said that like this painting the, the blue one over here which you know i know but no one knows what we're talking about but um, <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's a painting i've been working on for probably over three months but but i've actually only done done physically done something to it probably three or four times 
Mm. So most of that time has been spent just looking at it, just thinking about it, putting other things next to it. Yeah. And so, you know, that that time, that passing of time isn't always related to, to putting paint on or or whatever. Sometimes it's it's just sitting with a work and trying to think about which parts yeah. are working and which parts aren't and do all you, those sorts of things. Do you like working under pressure when you have to do a show for an exhibit? Uh, yes and no. I, I don't like it in the sense that it's not always conducive to the way that I'd like to work. But then I've had shows that I had so long to prepare for, you know, like literally a year and a half and still worked right up <laughs> until the very last day that yeah. I could. So yeah. I realised that time is kind of, um, although it's something that's fixed, when it comes to making artworks, for me it, it's sort of it bends and stretches according to what, you know, to what I have to get done by, by when basically. So mm. I've learnt that um, deadlines are actually really good because as long as they're not too crazy, um, I think I, they bring my bet. I think I do my best work yeah. under that sort of pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that you're being lazy. It's just that, you know, some people would disagree with this, but I think, I think you could make a painting in three months or you could possibly make the same painting in a year. You know, like, it, it, it all depends on yeah, well, what the time frame is. Yeah, I think the ideas are all, you know, as an, as an artist or, you know, I think you'll always have, like, you'll never, there's that argument about creating your best work. Yeah. Some people think that there's a certain period where you can only create your best work, but I think it's just a constant approach. You just have to listen to it. You'll just create yeah. different works, and maybe some will resonate with, a certain group of people more so than another. Yeah. But I think it's just like that creative flow and that mindset is just something that exists within you. So whether you have like a month or whether you have a year, um, you know, some of those deadlines are like you were saying, they're, they're really good to have just so you constantly pump. Yeah. Work out. I think that's the most important part is just to constantly like, for sure, be able to push work out to further this concept of incubating ideas a few months prior to this episode with Adam Lee, I had a conversation with filmmaker Julius Ona on episode number 20 about incubating ideas in isolation versus creating ideas with collaborators. I liked his personal philosophy about isolating yourself to create new ideas and then bringing those ideas to trusted friends and colleagues to get their opinions. Here's what Julius had to say on episode 20. So... You said that you create a lot of your ideas alone. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Concentration. And this is the same reason about the social media thing. It's like, you know, I, I mm-hmm. personally, I work best when I can close the door and sit in absolute quiet with nothing distracting me and just get lost in my thoughts. And that's where I get my ideas. Um, so I need that solitary confinement yeah. to be at my most creative. Yeah. There are other times when, you know, it's great to have people around you and talk things out, but, you know, there are two different energies and there are two different types of thinking. And I think for the deep, 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 what I find is really helpful when I'm talking to somebody is the problem solving. Like the problem solving is much easier to do when I talk it out with somebody else, but the creating, like to come up with something new, like the actual gestation process and delivery process that I find is most successful being done alone. So you'll, so you'll go to someone with maybe uh, some, some questions that you're marrying on for a script or something. And you already have maybe like a, a portion of it created and you'll ask someone, what do you think about this? I mean, obviously someone you trust, but yeah. is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like to get the idea for a new movie or a new screenplay or whatever the case might be, Mm-hmm. that I need to do by myself. It's very rarely that like that can be done with other people, but when I'm making something, mm-hmm. you know, writing the script or yeah. editing, you know, that's where a collaboration 
I mean, that's where collaboration is really great mm-hmm. um, because so much of the creative work is problem solving. Um, mm, you know. That's interesting. It's interesting that you said that the creative work is problem solving because a lot of the people that I've been interviewing and so I interview people from like musicians and painters and photographers, directors, you know, but pretty much anyone in a creative arts. And a lot of people talk about creative problem solving is like a big thing for them. And it's interesting to see that among different platforms, I guess, or different yeah. mediums of yeah. art. You know, it's uh, the hardest thing about getting an idea is executing the idea um, and, That's true. And, and taking it from something that is intangible to something yeah. that, um, you know, creates uh, uh, an experience for somebody, whether it's an emotion or provokes an idea and there's a certain coherency you need yeah. to have. Um, and that's where it gets really complicated. Mm. And then, you know, especially with, with filmmaking, it's, it's the ultimate because you end up often taking just about every media that exists, you know, mm-hmm. images and, and yeah. performance and the written and words noise and, and sound and, and music. And, yeah. and, and then to take all those things and make them operate coherently uh, yeah. and seamlessly. Um, is, it can be a, a challenge. It's a behemoth. While incubating these ideas, It's also important to question the intention of why you would want to create. There was a few months where I was continually asking people about the reason for creating. I think I hit an existential crisis at that point, and I was really fascinated by the purpose and meaning for creating. As I continued to search for answers, I had a conversation with painter Ellie Smallwood on episode number 64. Here's what she had to say about questioning creating and being okay with not always having the answer. You know, something that that's been coming up a lot in my train of thought is just the simple question of why, like, why do we create? Cause I'm an artist myself, but it's like, mm-hmm. why do, why do we create these things? Like what's, what is the reasoning behind us creating these things for the world to see and putting you know, our hearts out there, you know, whether it be like a painting on a canvas or whether it be like a photograph. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something that I'm asking myself almost every time I'm making art. And it's something that I don't think I'll ever understand the reasons behind it. And I don't think I'd ever want to. I think part of why you make art isn't like to find an answer to that question, but it's more just a part of asking that question kind of continuously just being like, I don't know exactly why I'm making this but I there's something there and I also don't really think I'll ever be able to put words to it because words aren't what I excel in you know painting is and so I never really try to figure out exactly what it is I'd rather just try to capture it in a painting and there's there's certain times and there's definitely more specific subject matters that I want to touch on and sometimes that's female sexuality and sometimes that's like female menstrual cycle or whatever it may be. And a part of that for me is also, I think certain subjects need to be talked about more in order just to remove some of the stigmatization around them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would never go into peace, never go into a painting solely trying to like, convey a message. I think so much of it should just be kind of visceral and like gut instinct and not something you really mm, clearly understand, yeah. but something you just feel the need to create. I think it's natural for us to want to piece together and make sense out of these seemingly non sequitur trains of thought into something tangible and concrete. However, sometimes things are not so easy to explain. Counter to the idea of creating in isolation, this next segment is from episode number 100, where I talked to my business partner at No Wave Justin Dosher Hopkins about collaborating and how we developed a strong collaborative partnership. This particular segment is very significant to me because prior to my partnership with Justin, I never experienced a long-term collaboration with any other creative. He truly showed me through his actions what it means to have someone's back in business and in life and how to synergistically work as a unit. He showed me that banding together with the right people can play significant roles in the development of your creativity and helps enrich in your purpose for continuing down your creative journey. 
more than anything, I've tried to tried to develop myself through just probably a um, self-defense mechanism of like trying to uh, be, become more of a strategist, to, like develop myself as a strategist. So learning, because I've been in so many different fields by this time in my life, because I think I got started young and instead of going to college, I did like a more of like an apprenticeship, like work thing. Like I was in all these different fields from a very young age. You kind of learn not only like the technical skills of it, but the communication skills of like dealing with egos and like understanding people and reading people and, and then strategizing how everybody can get what they want out of an instance. Because what you, what you realize like in all these creative fields is really what you're butting up against is people who have got egos or people who want, they have their own visions and, and like, and like, uh, sometimes they'll just dig their heels in just to, uh, for a will to power kind of thing, right? So it's like, kind of like, is it better to bend so you won't break? Is it better to use the, the, the momentum and leverage for your own benefit? Like, you know, just like taking everything you can from the things you've learned from these different fields and like kind of seeing what the best way to hew a path for your, your vision. And if you can, make make it appear that your vision is their vision then at the end of the day it's still your vision or whatever the project suits suits the project best by you know like paring your own ego down to whatever services the project and if it's a good project everybody wins mm -hmm. it's kind of like that philosophy you know yeah so if you go into it that way versus like the first the be first idea is best idea which a lot of people enter a job with that's so toxic you know cuz like you will butt into all kinds of walls because usually the first idea isn't the best idea. You know, that's why people sketch shit out. That's why people do things over and over and over again because they're trying to figure something out. If they just let the project be the end goal and the best possible way to get to that is the best thing, then you become adaptable and that's the mm -hmm. best strategy. Yeah. You know, have you ever thought about our creative partnership and why that works or why that continues to work? I think about it a lot, all the time. Um, uh huh. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in a way, like, you know, I just, like, <laughs> I'm totally going to keep that part. Anyways, go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's always a mystery as to why certain things, like certain combinations of personalities and, and backgrounds, um, like, are, are effective, you know? And, uh, I think ours is effective because, there's certain gaps and holes that are filled by the other person. <laughs> For those listening at home, I just winked, <laughs> yeah. winked from across the table. <laughs> I was, I was thinking, are, are, are you going to react to that gaps and holes thing, or am I just going to let this go on? Let's just say, how about, how about we, uh, okay, like strike that from the record. Certain blind spots <laughs> that yeah. the other person has covered, right? So, uh, in that situation, and there seems to be a level of, like, the philosophy I was just discussing, like, the project, project-based thing. Like, at the end of it, like, there's a healthy ego between both of us, which you need to get anything done, you know, to see the importance of anything you're doing. You need to have a certain healthy level of ego. But then also the, uh, the be able to be detached from your own ego to get to the end, pro the end product. And I think we've both had to take back seats to each other at certain instances in order to facilitate that. And I think that's healthy in any, like, in any, uh, relationship, whether it be like in your interpersonal relationships or business relationships, it's always good to see the greater picture, you know? And I yeah. think that's from the beginning, that's the way it's always been, you know? So it's, we don't usually yeah, get in naturally. fights. Yeah. Like we don't get in fights. We like, we have, debates about like you're like oh i don't like this and you're like oh why is that and like i don't like this and you're like why why don't you like this and we figure out why those things are and then uh, i think it's just communication is good and there's nothing like that i can say that will make you mad or and vice versa you know it's like it's not like it's it's just a healthy partnership in that way so i mm -hmm. think that's when the the communication and egos are in check then the the product is is better you know Thank you all for listening to this Artist Decoded Mindwave series episode. I want to do more of these, so definitely let me know what you all think. I also want to thank everyone for listening to this podcast and being an active part in the development of this podcast. It has been such an incredibly enriching experience, whether you all are aware of it or not. 
but you all have given me the courage and confidence to keep going artistically and spiritually. Everyone who has left comments, reach out to me on Instagram or over email. You are all champions in your own right, and I want to express how deeply you all have moved me. I'm going to leave you all with one more segment to end the episode. Here's a conversation I had with my friend, musician, actor, artist, TV on the radios, Tune Yana Bimpe for episode 105. Here's what he had to say. I would say the piece of advice that um, a friend of mine gave me when I moved to New York, and I was really kind of having this problem where I was just like, I don't know, I like doing comics, I like painting, I like making movies, all this stuff. And uh, he was, you know, an older artist who, uh, you know, collage artist that I ran into, you know, at a comic store. He was just like, you want to hang out? And I was like, I guess so. And like, then I found out he like had a one man show with a Whitney and all this stuff. And like, oh wow, you know, and I, so I, you know, would like go and hang out every once in a while. And I was just kind of like, I don't really know, man. I don't know what, I don't really know what I should do. And he said, you should be doing as much as you can just go. Like you'll figure out what you should be doing by doing it. Artist Decoded is a no-wave production. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. If you'd like to donate, go to artistdecoded.com. Feel free to email us at info at artistdecoded.com.